Thanks, everyone. Um, so as he said, my name is Sean. Uh, I work for a company called Rapid7. We do security stuff. If you're interested in talking about that, you can come find me after the talk. Um, you almost everybody calls me Savvy. Uh, my Twitter handle is sort of in the corner right there. If you want to tweet at me and tell me that you love the talk or you hated the talk, um, go right ahead. Uh, I love chatting on Twitter all day. Um, so feel free to do that. So broadcasting channels, writing timeout aware abstractions to enable asynchronous fan out in Go. That is quite the mouthful. Uh, and a lot of times when I pitch conference talks, I come up with this elaborate title to and kind of encapsulate everything that I want to talk about. And it becomes way too much to actually fit on a slide. Um, but luckily, this time I actually got it all on one slide. Um, so what am I actually here to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about the concept of taking a channel, which very smartly encapsulates the idea of a one-to-one -one communication pattern, so one message in, one message out, and how you can use nothing but the standard library to extend that into a fan out or a broadcast uh, type system. And I'm going to sort of use those two terms interchangeably. Um, so really, when I say fan out or broadcast, all I'm talking about is one message in to a potentially uh, n number of uh, subscribers who want to receive intent about that message. So one day, uh, I was kind of bored, because every now and then, I will occasionally find myself with a little bit of free time. Uh, and I will choose to write code for the sake of writing code in my free time, um, because that's the kind of boring individual that I can be. Uh, and I said, I asked myself a very simple question, and that was, how hard would it be to make something in Go that does fan out? And I wasn't really concerned with, let's say, a worker pool style abstraction, where you're doing one message in and potentially um, n number of receivers who could all do a first come, first serve uh, reception of that message. What I really wanted to do was have multiple receivers that could all get a copy of that message. And you know, maybe they care about that, maybe they don't care about it, but that's, that's sort of on them to determine. Um, I really wanted to just figure out, hey, how hard would it be to take a channel and turn it into something that can do broadcast? Uh, and the answer to that question is something that we'll figure out as I go through this talk. Uh, so I built a library. Uh, and I want to be really clear that I'm not here to promote this library or say, like, hey, you should go use this library in production. You probably actually shouldn't. Um, but what I wanted to do was sort of use this as an exemplar of how you could enable such a thing uh, in Go, again, with nothing but the standard library and the out-of-the-box toolkit that that enables. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to walk through that, but specifically to walk through the trade-offs and the problems that I ran into when I was building this uh, as a way to sort of teach about not only the concept of fan out and broadcast, but also how you might go ahead and implement it in Go, but also poten potentially other languages as well. Uh, and it's also a little bit of an allegory about how your best intentions can sort of spiral out of control once you just start poking it at the bear a little bit. Um, so in other words, uh, what I did was I wrote code solely to write code, and I didn't have a specific instance of this problem I was trying to solve. And when you do that, you often end up with something that's a lot different uh, than if you actually had a very concrete implementation of a problem that you wanted to solve. Uh, and to be clear, when you choose to write code, whether you're writing for a very specific problem, typically at work where you're paid to do this, or if you're doing it at home for fun where you're just kind of uh, writing code in a vacuum, both of those approaches are perfectly fine and valid ways to write code, but you can often end up with uh, a very, very different result at the end of it due to the constraints uh, that you find yourself within. So one thing that's often helpful, regardless of how you're writing code, is once you start to write something, you really want to define the problem. You want to define what you're actually trying to uh, solve or what you're trying to provide. Uh, and so I had roughly four things that I wanted to do here. Uh, one is I wanted to enable fan out inside of a process. So very, very specifically, I'm not dealing with uh, IPC. Uh, I wanted to stick to just a simple slice of bytes as my message format. I wanted to make it easy to manage subscriptions, and I wanted to ensure the highest guarantee of deliverability that I could. Uh, and if you've ever worked in messaging systems before, you know that deliverability uh, can be, and durability can be kind of a difficult topic. Um, so I, didn't, I wanted to make sure specifically that there was no issue in my library that prevented somebody uh, from receiving a message. Whether or not uh, the external systems that integrate with this library have a problem, that's not really, that's not really my problem. That's, that's the user's problem. Um, I didn't want to try and solve for that in a universal sense. Um, but equally, and sometimes even more important, is that you want to define what you don't intend to support. Uh, and to be crystal clear, for anyone who wants to spend their time writing a library, whether it's for work or for uh, personal use, um, you're always within your right to state at the very uh, top of um, 
of your work that these are the problems that I am not going to solve. These are the things that I'm not concerned with. I'm concerned with providing X, Y, Z. ABC is for you to solve. Uh, and so here is sort of a, a list of things that I had sort of said that wasn't going to be my problem, or potentially my problem yet. If, let's say, somebody was to use this library and they made a really great case that they needed one of these problems solved, well, then it's, you know, then it's more of a discussion, and sometimes you're wrong, and you do need to support these things. But at the outset, you kind of have to put a limited box around what you're going to do, or else you're never going to get anything done. So I didn't want to do managing communication between processes. Um, there's a lot of gotchas. Everybody wants to do it slightly differently. Uh, and it's, it's actually very, very difficult, even though we have a lot of out-of-the-box solutions for it uh, today. I didn't really want to worry about the latency or the performance of the library itself. Um, in, in general, you should always make it right and then try to make it fast. When you try to make it fast first, you usually mess something up. Uh, at least I do, all the time. Um, so I focus more on making it right and then finding ways to improve performance after the fact. I also didn't want to have to be involved with managing durability of the messages in flight. So I didn't want to communicate back to, you know, let's say SQS or NATS or Kafka or any of that kind of stuff. That was, that's on the user to determine. All I want to make sure is that while I have the message in my code, um, it's not on, uh, it, it's not going to fall out of memory somewhere. It's not going to crash and burn. Uh, and I also don't want to manage the message lifecycle. So again, you know, acting messages or you know, writing um, commits to a database about where I am in my Kafka log or anything, that's again 100% on the user of the library. Uh, I just wanted to provide a very simple mechanism to make the messages move from one input to multiple receivers. Uh, and I also didn't want to manage any complex routing logic. This is fan out. Uh, so I'm not trying to do intelligent delivery. I'm just trying to do delivery. So when I started writing this library, uh, I have this very high-tech uh, diagram here uh, featuring my dog. Uh, and I will say right now, if you don't like dogs, uh, this is probably not the talk for you, because this is not the last time you'll see this handsome gentleman uh, in my talk. Um, but I had this idea of what it was going to look like. And I think this is pretty common, because when you first set out to write code, you always have this idea of what it's going to look like in your head. And that's usually not where it ends up. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about today. So I had this idea that a dog might make a nice, friendly bork into a channel. And then maybe one of the receivers would say, yes, this is a very good bork, and I like it. I want to have more borks. And another receiver might say, no, thank you. I only like woofs. Give me all the woofs. Do not give me the borks. And this is really, and I'm not lying, this is really what I thought it would sort of look like in my head uh, when I was writing this at the outset. And what I ended up with is something a little bit more like this. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with what this is, uh, this is a GIF. It's not my GIF. I found this. Um, but it really does <laughs> map to what I think I ended up with um, of, a, of a game called The Incredible Machine. Uh, and I spent a lot of time as a kid playing The Incredible Machine uh, instead of learning how to write programming. And if you ever looked at my code, that would be pretty obvious. Um, but by the time I got to this sort of the end of this self lesson on how I would do this in Go, um, this, this is sort of what it ended up looking like, embarrassingly enough. There was, all these new moving parts and all these new conditions and all these things that along the way I encountered. Um, and really, at the end of it, it was just like, did it have to be this complicated? And depending on the need that you need to provide, the answer is either yes or no. And it's, it's very, very context specific. And I'll, I'll walk through what those contexts are. So you may ask yourself, how did he get here? Which is a great song if anybody's heard of it. Um, and the answer is with the best of intentions. Um, at every turn, like I said, I came up with a new and imagined constraint or concern that had to be solved with this library to make it usable. Uh, and you might ask, uh, usable by whom? And I don't really have an answer for that because I was the only one who was concerned with using it because this was really just sort of an intellectual exercise for me. Uh, and that's sort of where it started to spiral out of control because I didn't have any real constraints or any other person to come along and say, hey, this is, these are the, uh, the product requirements that we need out of this, uh, out of this system. And so I thought it would be an interesting challenge to do the thing that you're always told not to do, which is live code. But then I had a better idea, which is that I would give a good talk. <laughs> and so instead of making you all suffer through my inability to type while somebody is watching me, uh, what I thought I would do is I would walk through um, these nine problems that I ran into and uh, uh, basically address how I solved each one. And then at the end of that, I'll actually show you what the code looks like. And in doing so, what I'm going to do is 
deconstruct all those problems, and I'm going to live delete code from a working sample to show you just how simple it can actually be if you really don't care about any of this stuff. Because it really is pretty simple as long as you don't care about any of these problems. And you probably do care about some of these problems, but at its core, Go actually makes it pretty easy to get a very rudimentary version of this running out of the box. I, I answered the initial question within a few you know, minutes, quite honestly, and then it was my own sense of shooting myself in the foot that kept leading me to make this more and more complicated. So I'll also say that not all of these are Go-specific problems. Um, a lot of these things that I'm going to point out are going to be framed through the lens of solving them with Go, but a lot of these are really just things that you would run into in other languages, or even if you tried to model this type of approach at a high level in a language agnostic way, um, you would run into a lot of these things as well. So these are very broadly applicable to the problem space of how do I take one message and give it to a bunch of people uh, roughly all at once. So the first problem that I had was broadcast delays. Uh, and just again, to be clear about when I say like these are imagined problems, they were imagined by me, but they are definitely very real. Um, and the first thing that I imagined having a problem with is the idea of starvation or broadcast delays. So if you have a list of, let's say, 100 subscribers, and you're just going over that list in order and pushing out that message copy to each one, the subscriber at the end of that list is always going to be the one who gets the slowest message. And by the time they get it, it that, that message could be too old for them to care about, uh, or it just you know, could provide a lot of unnecessary latency to their experience. So, the first problem right away was if I have a big list, somebody's going to be getting the short end of the stick uh, latency-wise. And so the solution to that was to add Go routines. Uh, and this is my face when I add Go routines to things. Um, so by turning the broadcast message method into one that spawns a Go routine uh, per subscriber, I was able to very quickly overcome the idea of the last message in the chain, or the last subscriber in the chain, rather, getting the oldest copy of the message. Uh, now, to be clear, there's obviously still a little bit of delay there, right? Because there's a little bit of time to spawn a Go routine. The scheduler has to pick it up and decide to run it. Um, but I sort of said, look, if you're under uh, latency requirements so tight that you can't wait for the scheduler, well, you've probably got bigger problems than I'm willing to imagine right now. Uh, definitely bigger problems than I had when I was doing this. The second problem is what I would call timeliness. And I sort of uh, talked about this a second ago. Um, there could be messages that after a certain window of time are just no good anymore. Uh, a lot of times when you're doing a, a fan out or a broadcast uh, approach, you're, you're sort of just throwing messages out into the wind. And people have registered the intent to receive them, but they may not want all of them. They may only want messages that are within a certain window of time from when they were originally produced. And that, that's, a, that's a very real concern. Um, you could also say that this is the concern of the thing that's consuming them to decide that the message is too late, but maybe not all messages have timestamps or accurate timestamps. Um, so it's convenient to provide a way to do timeouts. Uh, and so you want to make sure that if somebody can't get a message within a certain period of time, we just drop that on the floor. Um, and this also helps prevent the idea of just spawning endless Go routines that are constantly blocked on channels that will never uh, be freed up because their consumer is blocked for some reason um, so that you don't have a huge Go routine spill all, all inside of your application. So the solution to that was easy enough, was timeouts. Um, thankfully, Go gives us a lot of really good stuff right out of the box. We have contexts and we have the concept of a duration and we can use those to establish timeouts uh, when publishing asynchronously to a channel. Uh, and by establishing a basic timeout for the broadcast on the publisher, so the publisher says, hey, I'll never send you a message older than three seconds, let's say. Um, this helps prevent that Go routine leak, and it helps to make sure that the messages that subscribers get are within the window of time that they probably want. But what happens if subscribers don't want that timeout? What happens if subscribers have no tolerance at all for messages uh, that are within the window of time that the publisher wants? Or maybe they're you know, collectors and they want every message no matter what under the sun. They want to make sure that even if a message is you know, five hours late, they still want to get it. Um, that's a perfectly valid thing for a subscriber to want. So I thought to myself, well, how do I solve that? And this is sort of a cheap answer here, but the solution is just you add more timeouts. Specifically, you let the subscriber provide their own override to the default timeout. So the publisher will say, hey, in my opinion, if you get a message later than three seconds, it's not worth it to you. But the subscriber might say, well, you know what, that's your opinion. I want messages that are you know, w within one second, or I want messages that are within 10 seconds. Uh, and again, both of those are perfectly valid. And it's pretty easy to do that. You just allow subscribers, uh, once they subscribe to the system, to say, hey, just this is what I expect in terms of when I should get a message. 
So we've taken a very simple loop over a list of channels and send a message in a Go routine, and we've complicated this a bit. Uh, we've added these timeouts, which means that we can no longer guarantee a message could be delivered. And if you've been paying attention, we actually couldn't guarantee that before, because again, if there's a message that we send a channel on and it's blocked forever, which is possible, uh, we couldn't guarantee that message got delivered anyways. But now we've added a whole new vector for failure. We've added a whole new way uh, that messages cannot reach their intended receivers. And so up until this point, everything is done asynchronously, so out of band. So we have no chance to return an error up the call stack, which as Go developers, we love returning errors up the call stack. So the question becomes, how do we propagate errors back to the caller in a way that doesn't break this asynchronous pattern? And the solution is more channels, specifically an errors channel. Uh, our publisher can expose a single channel that we will pipe all of our errors through so that the user of this package or the user of the publisher can spawn off a Go routine or potentially multiple Go routines if their error handling uh, is expensive or takes too much time and they uh, receive a, a backup in the errors um, so that they can listen for errors and handle them gracefully that way. And maybe they just want to log them out. Maybe they just want to uh, ignore them. Uh, that's on them. But they do have to, at least in the implementation I have, they do have to receive on this channel or else eventually the entire thing will, will block up if you have too many errors. Um, however, I would say that if you're being overwhelmed by errors, it would probably imply you have other problems that aren't really within uh, this framework, and you should probably investigate why you're spilling so many errors everywhere. So the next problem is how do you handle publishing failures? So adding an error channel was simple in theory, but we now have another problem, which is that when we do fail to publish a message, uh, it isn't enough to just say, hey, a message failed. We have to provide what that message was so that the caller or the user of this library can get that data back and make a determination about how to handle it. Um, you don't just want to let that data hit the floor. At the very least, you need to return to them some way to identify what message didn't get to where it needs to go. And so the question is, well, how do you do that? And the answer is that you have specialized errors. So in Go, there's a really good pattern around making structs uh, that represent errors as long as they adhere to our beloved error interface. And there's even uh, another higher level pattern around providing what you might call behavioral interfaces that describe errors so that uh, consumers can say, hey, does this error contain a subscriber, uh, uh, sorry, a, a message body? Uh, and if so, they can choose to take an action to recover that message body, maybe store it somewhere later, take a look at it at another point in time, um, or do something else with it. Um, but you, we need to make sure that the user or the, the, the individual who is doing the publishing can find out about these errors in a way that they can actually take a meaningful action over them. Just logging them out isn't always going to be sufficient, especially when these might be important messages that need to get to important places. So in that, we have another problem, in that we need to enable retries. So we've added a problem that just can't be solved by informative errors alone. So once we've added the ability to have a timeout, and specifically for each subscriber to override their own timeout, we've opened up a whole new vector again. So what happens when one message out of 20 fails? Or even worse, the pathological case, when 19 out of 20 fail? You know, it's not really sufficient to say, well, hey, you're just going to have to rebroadcast that again, and I hope you've got dedupe set up because you're just going to keep getting copies of messages over and over again. That's really inefficient, and it, in my opinion, put a little bit too much of an onus on the consumer of the message to do something complicated like dedupe, which is not always easy and can itself be fraught with a lot of peril and is a lot of work to get right. So the question is then, how do you make it so that these people, uh, these users of the library, can recover individual messages to individual subscribers? And the answer to that is to use a named subscriber and you add a direct send method. And so this is actually kind of an interesting point in the project for me, because at this point I had to rethink the entire contract to the library itself. At this, prior to this, it was, hey, there's a broadcast method, and that's it. That's all you get. You can add subscribers, and then you can broadcast to those subscribers. But now, I had to find a way to make it so that folks could retry these messages to individual subscribers if they failed. And so the solution I came up with was to have subscribers be provided with a unique ID, and if you subscribe somebody who doesn't have a unique ID, or uh, you don't have an ID at all, those are just additional errors that we return asynchronously down the errors channel. And so in this way, we can have errors that are scoped to the whole of the broadcast, or to individual subscribers, and the user of this library can now control the destiny of their messages, uh, wherever that may be, to whatever needs that the user of this library might have. 
So we're getting pretty close at this point. But it's also fairly realistic to expect that somebody might want to unsubscribe or, or no longer register their intent to receive these messages. And so we're not quite there. How do we handle removing users from the system? How do we handle making sure that people can't receive messages anymore if they don't need them? And the answer there is now that we have our subscriber IDs, it's easy for the user of the publisher to track all these subscribers with a unique identifier, so they can simply say, hey, this thread or this worker or this so-and-so is shutting down. I want to unsubscribe them from the mailing list. I no longer want you to even try to send on their channel. Um, please remove them from the distribution. And so, of course, this adds even more errors, because what if they try to send, uh, what if they try to unsubscribe somebody who uh, is no longer subscribed or was never subscribed? So that's yet another error that we have to consider throwing down that errors pipe. The other problem that this adds is to, uh, to make sure that we control the subscriber, we have to sort of assume control of its channel. So in this case, when you unsubscribe, you want to make sure that you're stopping that channel so that the receiver who is, pipe, who is uh, popping messages off at the end of, the end of this channel can effectively get a message that says, hey, this channel is finally done. It's no longer going to emit messages to you. You're, you're completely safe to tear down this go routine or, um, or what have you that is listening to this channel. Uh, and so as you can see, every time that we add a new problem, the service area, or that we tackle a new problem, the service area for additional problems and additional complexity continues to blossom outward. So we're getting really close here. Uh, and we can stop individual subscribers. And that's pretty useful in and of itself. But how do we initiate a full shutdown? So when the process itself receives a signal, say term, say kill, kill nine, whatever, what have you, uh, the process needs to shut down, hopefully not kill nine. Um, we want to make sure that the process that's governing the publisher is able to find out which messages are currently in flight that are never going to get to a receiver because we've shut them down. So there's always that window of time, especially in a high, highly asynchronous system, where something is sort of moving through the system but has not been received yet. Uh, and that's always tricky to solve for. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make it so that the user of this library can receive messages that say, hey, this message failed not because of a timeout or not because of any other error, but because we are shutting down now. And it's on you to make sure that you track these messages somewhere for retry when we come back up. Um, and it's not really, in my opinion, a good solution to say, well, you know what, I gave you an unsubscribe method, and you probably remember all the unique IDs for your subscribers. Why don't you just you know, manually unsubscribe all of them um, yourself? In my opinion, since we're already tracking all that state internally, it only really makes sense to have a sort of a full way to say, hey, turn everything off right now in a you know, sane, uniform, consistent manner. And the solution to that is another method and another channel. Um, this is actually where my dog stops on his walk every single day. There are two dogs that he likes playing with, and we can't get by this yard without him waiting for them to come outside. Um, so at this point, this is actually really, really easy to solve. We've done a lot of work already, and these problems, while they keep adding up, because of the toolkit that we've already built, we can handle them by composing a lot of the stuff that we already have. So specifically, because we've already done this work to have this ability to safely stop subscribers, we can just leverage that, and we can do that internally ourselves. So the stop method does a few things. It includes a quit channel, and you can it will close that quit channel, which tells the rest of the library, hey, we're shutting down now, so for example, uh, you know, don't allow new messages in. Um, and it also provides a method for somebody who is looking at this um, library or this object to say, hey, are you stopped yet? So they could even gate their own publishing if they wanted to, but they don't necessarily have to, because the broadcast method itself should also be safe enough to say, hey, I'm shutting down. You should not send me any messages. Um, and we can also gate, we can gate all this stuff, like I said, to make sure that we don't get any messages in between. Or can we? And so this was actually the hardest problem to solve at the very end uh, of my working on this code. Um, just putting that stop method, or that, uh, that quit channel, in front of the broadcast actually isn't enough. Because if anyone here has ever worked on highly concurrent, highly trafficked systems, there's always things that sneak in behind your mutexes when you don't expect them. Um, or behind your locks, I should say. Uh, and in this case, it was very possible to have messages move through the broadcast method that got by the am I stopped yet check before, uh, or rather, right as we were stopping, uh, stopping the publisher. And so now, we have a little bit of a problem. We're closing channels 
but we're continuing to attempt to send to channels, which if anybody has ever had to try to do that, you get a panic, which is not really a great thing for a library to do. Libraries in Go are not supposed to panic uh, because it is very hard to recover from that and it's sort of hard to wrap your head around when the right time to panic is and it's also just in general a bad design. Um, it, it's a pretty nasty behavior and there's not really a super great way to solve it out of the box. Uh, but, you know, so far I've been feeling pretty confident about what I've done, so surely there must be an elegant way to solve for this. Um, and the answer was that there really wasn't outside of just having a panic recoverer. Uh, so I had a lot of ideas around, well, I could put more stop channels or I could put the stop channel check in more places, but it didn't really matter because no matter where I put that check, something was always sneaking by it, no matter what. I wasn't able to even lock out with a test that didn't bomb with a panic when I moved the, the, the gate around or when I just added gates everywhere. There was always one that got to one of those channels and blew things up on me. And so what I had to do was I had to defer a panic recovery handler. And it was at this point when I actually had to put panic recovery into something that I declared myself done solving problems. Uh, I still had no use for what I was working on other than to solve my own curiosity, and I was spending an, spending an awful lot of time trying to solve problems that I wasn't really running into outside of just this imagined scenario, and I actually had to put a panic recoverer in code that I wrote myself, and so my spirit was effectively broken at that point, and I conceded that I no longer had the wherewithal to fight imaginary monsters. So, to recap, I had nine specific problems as I was working through this code. There was potential starvation. I know that, that text is probably a little bit small, so I apologize. There was timeliness. There was configurable timeouts. There was how to communicate errors. And then there was having specialized broadcast failure, so specialized errors to inform the user about what went wrong. Uh, I also needed to, I found out, enable retries, which is not something that I thought about when I initially set out to do this, which is where that, which is really where the library changed how it looked a great deal. Uh, I also decided that I needed to provide a mechanism for unsubscription, and that I wanted to handle graceful shutdown, and that I did not want to have any panics, at least any panics in my code. I can't really control what happens in somebody's, pan, uh, somebody's own consumer, uh, but I didn't want my code to panic, because I, I really couldn't deal with the personal uh, hit to my pride if my own code was panicking. Um, there are also a lot of nifty bonus problems that at this point I could have continued to try to tackle, but I did not. Uh, and I think it was important enough that I identified what these problems were, but I was still pretty happy with the fact that, well, until somebody actually tells me that they're using this and they care about any of this stuff, I've got other things to do, like, for example, try to get my dog to walk by that house. Um, and some of these are simply like a, you just can't please everybody. So no matter what, a solution for you is not going to be a solution for the next person. And some of them are really more, well, there's really no perfect answer to this. I could do it one way, and that means one set of trade-offs, and I could do it another way, and that means another set of trade-offs. And I just didn't care to solve for that anymore in the absence or the void of anybody actually using this to advise me as to what trade-offs would be beneficial for them. Uh, and some of those problems were, should the errors channel be buffered or not? Um, and if so, should it be a size of one or greater than one? Which is often, a, I think, a common thing that we talk about in Go. You know, buffered, unbuffered, one greater than one. Um, not my problem for right now. If somebody wants to use the library and give me some feedback on that, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. But nobody is. So, um, so what if somebody wanted no timeout at all? What if they just wanted something to block indefinitely forever? Well, God, you definitely shouldn't do that. But if you did. Um, you know, what if you wanted that? I wasn't able to provide that for you. Uh, and what if you wanted the, the lesser? What if you wanted to sort of like compose those timeouts and say, hey, give me the lesser of those timeouts? Or what if you wanted the greater of those timeouts? Uh, again, right now it's just sort of you get what you get and that's it. But you know, there could be more advanced or um, interesting ways to look at how to compose those timeouts together to get a more intelligent system. And what if consumers try to close their channels? Well, don't. Don't do that. That's my, that's my channel now. You, you don't get to touch it. You only get to read off of it. Don't close it. That's mine. Um, but what if they try to do it? Uh, please, God, I hope not. Um, don't. Don't close channels. If you give a channel to somebody and that, that individual is writing to it, you have lost control of that channel. It's not yours anymore. Don't touch it. Um, just read off of it and hope that they close it if they're being a good citizen. Um, and so those, these are some of the problems that I just decided, look, 
in, in absence of anybody using a library, I wrote this for fun, uh, it's not worth solving right now. But from a Go-specific standard, uh, a standpoint rather, these are actually very important questions to ask. And if you're going to implement a library like this, you actually really should think about these problems, uh, let's say in the context of a work situation where you have a production library or production code base that these problems could have very serious ramifications for. So, now for all that time travel I promised you earlier, um, I'm gonna show you what this actually looks like. Uh, and I will, what I will do is I will systematically rip to pieces all of this code and I will boil it down to its simplest parts. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of it first and then we'll start the deleting, which is always the best part uh, of any code project. So the first thing I'll do, oh, that's not, oh, hold on. Let me set up mirroring. Hey, there we go. Something always goes wrong. Um, okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll just show you some of the errors that I came up with. Uh, and I've got this collapse. Um, I use VS Code because I'm not smart enough to use Vim, so sorry for Vim fans uh, in the audience. Um, we ended up with six custom errors and three behavioral interfaces. Two of those are distinct, so they describe distinct behaviors, and one of those is a composed behavior, so it has basically both of those distinct behaviors. There's also a constant that just sort of identifies, hey, if this message has no subscriber ID, what is, a, what is a sort of a good gating value to just say like, hey, if this shows up in a log, you know that this meant the no subscriber instead of an empty string where you might think, well, is that, is that really no subscriber or is that, is that a mistake in the log? Um, so there's some simple interfaces like uh, has subscriber and has message, which will tell you if an error message uh, contains a subscriber ID or a message body. Uh, there's also the composed one, where we've used uh, embedding interfaces, which is a really interesting topic, uh, to combine those into a single uh, interface that's easy to assert on, because in the most common case is that you have both a subscriber ID and a message body. Uh, and then we just have a series of six errors here. There's, uh, actually, oh, five errors. Um, there's a publishing deadline error, which has the initial error that you'll get out of the context, it has the data that you tried to send, and it has the subscriber ID. There's an error for shutting down, um, and this sort of has two ways to work. It's got the data that you tried to send, and it potentially has a subscriber ID, or it potentially has that negative one constant that says, hey, you tried to shut down, but I caught it in that initial check in my gate, so this went to absolutely no receivers, so you should do a full broadcast of this again. Uh, and that's sort of what that error is meant to encapsulate. And then there's some other ones like if you have a duplicate subscriber, uh, or if you try to subscribe somebody without uh, an ID, or if you tried to unsubscribe somebody uh, or send it to somebody and you had an unknown subscriber, you don't know who that subscriber is. Um, so these are some of the errors that I encountered. And then the rest of this file is really just, um, these are all just the methods to implement so that they meet the interface contracts or they meet the error interface. Uh, and I actually like, I, I don't know if other people um, like doing this or not, I really like uh, putting all of my errors for a package in one file called errors.go. That way it's very, very easy to see where all the errors are and you can go to that one file and you can always see, hey, this is where uh, all of the errors that this library might return are um, so that you can learn about them in a little bit of an easier way. Um, I have tests, which are not as interesting, um, but please write tests. Um, and then there's the code base itself. So subscribers are pretty simple. They have an ID, they have a channel that you send on, they have a timeout that they can optionally define, and they have their own quit channel. Publisher is very sim similar. Um, it's got a nice little mutex hat that protects the map of subscriber ID to subscriber. It's got the errors channel we talked about. It's got that, uh, it's got its default duration, and it's got its own quit channel. Making a new one is pretty simple. We just sort of return a publisher. It's got all the default values for those things. Um, Subscribing is a little bit more complicated. This is where you have to do some of those checks. So you gotta make sure somebody provided an ID. You gotta make sure if they didn't give you a channel um, because they you know, might not uh, care to receive it or they might just be keeping, um, they might just want to uh, have this go nowhere effectively. Uh, you can make a new one. Um, if the timeout was zero, so I, didn't, I chose not to use a pointer to a timeout just to make it a little bit easier. Um, if the timeout is zero because I don't support no timeouts at all, zero means use the default. Uh, you know, you set your quit channel, you um, lock your subscriber structs so that you can uh, add them uh, to, the, to the list, uh, rather to check to see if it's already been in use. Uh, and if it's not already been in use, then you add it to the list and you just return. Sending is pretty easy. So sending to a direct person, I'll actually show 
the raw method first. Um, so sending to somebody, this is the low-level method that both the uh, public send to uses and the full broadcast uses. So the first thing we do is we create our timeout. We then defer the cancel, because if you don't, the linter will yell at you. Uh, you then defer the panic handler recovery. And I left myself this really big comment here about how frustrated and unhappy I was with myself that I had to put in panic recovery. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, so it's always good to put comments in your code. I always like to comment why, not what. And this why is how frustrated I am that I couldn't find a way around this. Um, typically, also, one other thing to note when you recover. Recover returns an interface, not just an error. So in this case, I knew that the error that I was going to recover was an actual error because I looked in the runtime itself. But oftentimes when you recover, if you're not 100% sure, or if you yourself are throwing panics, which typically you don't want to do, um, you should type assert on what you get out of it just to be safe that you don't panic within your panic recovery handler um, because that's not a place you want to be in. Um, so that method gets deferred so that it runs potentially once, this, uh, once the send to method closes. And then we just have a select that either checks to see if we're shutting down, checks to see if the deadline has been hit, or if not, it makes a best attempt to push onto uh, this channel until either the shutdown occurs, or the deadline is hit, or the channel is able to receive that message. Uh, and then to make it so that the users can call this method, we just have a couple of uh, simple wrappers. So the public send to takes in uh, the message that you want to send, and the subscriber that you wish to retry a message to. Again, we're using our locks, so we're checking if we're stopped. And if we are, we're piping that message down the errors channel. Um, we're using our locks to check if we know about that subscriber. And if we don't, we're sending another error down that channel. And if all goes well and we know about the subscriber, we just try to send to them right there. And then the broadcast method is very similar. It does a very similar thing, make sure that we're not shutting down. And if it doesn't, it just goes through all of the subscribers and it tries to send them a message. Uh, one thing that is probably not always super obvious, um, when you're putting things into Go routines and you're doing it in a loop, you always want to make a local copy of that thing first, or else you will run into a very fun bug where it looks like some of your receivers got three times as many messages as other receivers, and other receivers got nothing. And that is because, effectively, due to the way that closures work in loops, you were binding to a later copy of that value. So whoever was at the end of the loop in some of the early versions of this library were always getting way too many messages, and the people at the front were never getting nearly enough or sometimes even none at all. Um, so you always want to make a local copy of something when you're doing a closure like this inside of a loop. Uh, and then at the very end, we just unlock and we go on. A couple more methods here. There's one to stop, um, close the quit channel. We go over the subscribers. We close them. Stop method just checks whether or not we're true or false. Unsubscribe. Again, closes the uh, listeners, uh, removes them from the map, closes the channels, and deletes them from the list. And then the errors channel just returns an error that you can only pipe stuff off of. Um, and so, as I said, I want to start removing things from this, uh, from this code to show you just how simple some of this stuff can be. So let's say we don't really care about, um, we don't really care about timing out anymore. Well, we can just get rid of all, all this. We don't really need these timeouts. And so we can just start getting rid of stuff. We can get rid of these timeouts. And then once that happens, we won't have this anymore. We won't have to defer this cancel. We can get rid of this case. So we only have to worry about if we're shutting down or not. And that's about it. So now that we don't have timeouts, there's really no way for an individual subscriber to time out independent of anything else. So we don't really need these IDs anymore, do we? So we can get rid of the subscriber ID, and we can turn this from a map of subscribers into a slice of subscribers. And because we don't have the subscriber IDs anymore, we don't really need to enable a retry either. And because we don't have any of that, uh, we don't have the IDs, we don't need to handle unsubscribing. 
And so as you can see, as you start to unwind a lot of these, um, a lot of these assumptions about things that you might want, you can really start to delete a lot of code. And so we can even continue to go further. What if we don't really care about letting people control shutdown? What if it's just like, look, these are, we're going to scatter these all over the world, and if they get there, they get there. Well, we don't have to worry about quit channels anymore. Uh, we don't have to worry about, here we go, get rid of this ID stuff. Um, we don't have to worry about checking if subscribers are already known. So we can change this to be an append. The send to method, we could, we could just move this entirely back inside broadcast, but I'll keep it where it is for now. Um, because we don't have this quit channel anymore, well, the stop method goes away. The stopping method goes away. And we're, starting, we're left with something that's a lot more simple. And we can, we can even keep going and removing stuff from here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm close on time yet or not, but you can basically unwind this entire thing until you're right back into... This is always hard to type in front of people. Broadcast 2, B byte. And that's really it. This could be the entire library right here. Uh, with the addition of the publisher struct, um, because you really don't even need anything at this point. You actually don't even need the subscriber, because the subscriber itself isn't really important anymore. It's really just a channel of bytes. So we can even just get rid of the subscriber. Or we can keep going further and further down here. This would be an array of an array of bytes, or a slice of a slice of bytes, rather. Um, and we can keep just removing and removing and removing code until really all you have is just a simple range over a list of channels to push messages down. And if you don't care about any of that other stuff, if you don't care about unsubscribing, if you don't care about IDs, if you don't care about uh, deadlines or timeouts or anything like that, uh, it actually becomes really, really easy to just push messages to as many people as who want to receive them. Uh, and there's also, uh, if you're interested in this library, I'll, give, I'll show a link in a minute, but there's also a sort of a demo of how it works so that you can sort of model what it might look like to build an app off of it. Um, it's a little bit more complex than I have, I think, time for, so I will go back to this. Um, and that's it. That's my terrible code, and that's uh, how I did broadcast uh, over channels with Go. Um, If you, wanna, if you wanna take a look at it, it's at my GitHub, which is uh, github.com slash stabbykachi slash spub, which is a portmanteau of pub sub. Um, thanks, that's broadcasting channels, blah, 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 something or other, and go. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, I think this... Uh... Uh, I just wanted to mention that if you uh, pass the value in the for loop to some function, you don't need to make a local copy because you you make a copy when you pass it to a function. So uh, it, not if it's a pointer. Yeah, but it's a copy of the pointer. So it, so when you do this, uh, okay, we can go after that. Like yeah, uh, I don't. I would say I, I can show you what happens when you undo that, and what you're going to see is that the message counts per receiver per subscriber are not going to be correct. So if if you're not making local, if you're so. Yeah, so what, what you're talking about, I think what you might be missing um, is, let me just show real quick, the important part of that was uh, this. This means that the binding to that variable is not going to be what you think it is unless you've made a local copy. I can, I can show you a demo of it after the talk. Yeah, show me, but, uh, yeah, but I'm pretty sure. I think uh, this gentleman over here. In your broadcast two, you're firing off a Go routine to each of the subscribers for each of the messages. Yes. So that, that allows them to interleave in a different order. So it can change. Uh, yes, them. potentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so sorry, I guess that's actually a good point that I didn't specifically call out. This is not ordered. Um, or, ordering is always very difficult. Uh, and again, a thing that I didn't want to bother with was ordering. So yeah, you're 100% correct. It is not guaranteed to be uh, received in the order in which they were iterated over the, uh, the, the slice. Sure. Yeah. And also, oh, this gentleman? And then that gentleman over there. Oh, oh. I guess I'll go first. Uh, so why not well, create the channel yourself in the library and pass that to the subscriber rather than the other way around, the subscriber provide the channel for you? So the reason why I had the subscriber provide the channel is because I assume uh, that the, the individual who's using this library, they're going to want to be receiving from that channel. Uh, and um, I made this method not take a pointer to a subscriber. Um, so that once I, I get a local copy of that data structure in, so they wouldn't receive those changes um, uh, in another thread, basically. So you create the channel outside, you begin to pop off of it, and then you hand it to me, and then I begin to write to it. There is some, there is, um, it will, let's see, I may have re removed that code. It will, if you don't give it a channel, it will make one for you. Um, but the, I would say, intended use is you should give me a working channel, you begin to eat off of it, and I begin to push food down it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one. Spub, easy to remember. Yeah, if you have any other questions or you want to uh, talk after the talk, I'll be, I'll be around. So um, if you're too shy, um, you can always just grab me in the hallway. Well, thank you, sure. Okay, thank you.